In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I had never heard of the fast food chain Raising Cane's Chicken Fingers <laughs> until about this time last year when my son told us he was going to work at their location out at the Parker and Arapahoe Interchange. It seemed like I was one of a very few who had never heard of it. Regardless of my awareness, however, my son got his foot in the restaurant door and there, and over several months, learned a lot about frying chicken, making Texas toast, and serving odd, sometimes unreasonable customers. Greg changed jobs early last summer, and so I've had no other reason to think about canes for several months until this past week. In the midst of news about more major national and global events, CNN reported that Raising Cane's, like many other restaurants, has been having trouble finding employees. This labor shortage has caused restaurants, including Cane's, to shorten hours of operation, curtail mobile or ordering, and in some cases, close dining rooms. What made Raising Cane's situation especially newsworthy was their novel solution, asking corporate employees to serve as fry cooks and cashiers. As CNN reported, 250 of the company's 750 corporate employees will be, quote, going in the field as frontline employees. Close quote, and another 250 will, quote, work in other restaurant and recruiting jobs, unquote. To keep the company's momentum going, Kane wants to hire 10,000 more people in 50 days, some Pentecost, um, and, and will invest enough money to give hourly workers a 15 to 22% wage increase. In explanation for these unusual measures, Co-CEO and Chief Operating Officer A.J. Kumaran was quoted as saying, it's obviously unprecedented times, there's no playbook on how to get through it. And so it's all hands on deck. Kumaran, by the way, self-deployed to a unit in Las Vegas. Despite those descriptions about unprecedented times and all hands being needed, however, I have to wonder about those 500 corporate employees, how they feel about having to leave their desks for a fry table, the cash register, and ordinary customers. I mean, I've worked in the business world, as I know many of you have. And for me, being somewhat introverted, there was a certain comfort in my cubicle. <laughs> Fast food customer service was not on my bucket list. And so Jesus' words to his disciples sprang to mind. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. From what I've read about Cain's strategy, the goal is to keep local outlets afloat and operating while new employees are found and the current employees are given additional motivation, that is, higher wages, to stick around. I have no problem with that. But I have to wonder again, if there might be some other, perhaps unexpected benefit for Keynes because of this move. What if, and maybe this is already on the minds of corporate executives, upon the end of the 50 days, those who had, were temporarily exiled from their cubicles were called together to debrief. What did they learn from being on the front lines? What additional changes might the chain make, not just in operations, but in corporate culture? In other words, how might the experience of serving contribute to leadership? Our readings, both from Hebrews and, Math and Mark, seem to point in a similar direction, although as with many such comparisons, there are limits. Hebrews, 
despite numerous questions from it about its authorship and recipients, does give evidence of a couple of things. First, it was addressed to Christians who were experiencing some persecution. Many references to suffering, including in our reading this morning, make that clear. And second, the complex use of passages from the Hebrew Bible, including in our reading this morning, imply either a primarily Jewish audience or at least a congregation with very well-read, well-taught Gentiles. Our passage from Hebrews 5 this morning points to the role of the Jewish high priest, that figure in Israelite religion who had significant responsibilities in representing God to the people and the people to God. Chief among those responsibilities was making the sin offerings for the people, especially on the Day of Atonement, referred to in verse 3 of our reading. Hebrews 5 also points out that the high priest was chosen from among the people. And while given that special liturgical responsibility, was still of the people. He had to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the people. Hebrews contrasts his role with that of Christ. Christ, the author writes, did offer prayers and requests with loud cries and tears as his sacrifices to the one who was able to save him from death. But his sonship didn't prevent him from experiencing suffering and perhaps falling into sin. Rather, it gave him the opportunity to address that suffering through those prayers, requests, and obedience. The implication is that the suffering that the recipients of Hebrews were experiencing was also an opportunity to grow closer to God. Jesus's high priestly role does that for us, but as we confess that Jesus was both human and divine, our fallibility is made ever more real to the mind of God. As we heard last week, we have a great high priest, Jesus, God's son. We don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but instead one who is tempted in every way we are, except without sin. While Hebrews didn't put it quite this way, Christ became human, himself taking on the role of one who served God in order that we might better serve God. Of course, the role of servant is at the heart of our reading from Mark 10. While we didn't hear it this morning, the account actually begins a few verses earlier with Jesus's third prediction of his passion and death. After the first prediction, you'll recall, Peter gets into Jesus's face and tells him, this will never be. To which Jesus replies, get behind me, Satan. After the second prediction, the disciples start arguing over who would be the greatest in, the, in that coming realm. To which Jesus responds by telling them that whoever wants to be first must be last and the servant of all. And it is that last instruction that Jesus repeats this morning when James and John request the chief places of honor in the kingdom. The disciples, who most often represent us, don't get what it means to be great. As was the case with the previous two predictions, the disciples absolutely failed to get the point. The point that the Messiah, God's chosen one, has to serve in order to usher in the realm of God. As Paul wrote to the Philippians, self-emptying led to Jesus's exaltation. Or in the image of Hebrews, Christ also didn't promote himself to become high priest. Instead, it was the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. What Jesus' earliest followers expected of him was some sort of royal messiah, a return to some idealized Davidic or Solomonic past. All that he did seemed to them to point in that direction. His healing activities, the miracles, even some of his teachings seemed to raise hope that he would call down angels and overthrow the Romans. And as reflected in our reading from Mark, that royal messiahship could offer exalted roles for Jesus's most loyal followers. 
But the future reign of God was based on an entirely different foundation, serving others in such a way that justice and equity would be established, that healing was available to all, that those who were on the margins would be included. The question to us, of course, is pretty apparent. How are we to become servants or slaves of all? This is especially important coming out of COVID, as well as in considering our stewardship commitments. What are we being asked? What is expected of us? What does it mean to serve our broader community? Is it helping out at Covenant Cupboard or St. Clair's or the St. Francis Center? Is it advocating for the homeless, for the refugees, for equitable health care, for clean air and water? When those in the wider community see that, they'll see, whether they know it or not, Christ at work in the world, sacrificing his time and resources in the service of others. And they may say, I'll have me some of that and join in too. What does it mean to serve in this congregation, this little portion of the realm of God? Is it saying yes when asked to join a committee or the altar guild or to become a lector? Is it saying yes when being asked to consider the whole mission of Good Shepherd in the context of making a pledge? And what, would, what might we learn after we say yes and step beyond our assumptions, out of our building, and out of our comfort zone about our neighbors. I received an email last evening following our Altars in the World Sunset Evening Prayer. <laughs> Telling me that after we were done, a lady who'd been watching and listening asked what church we were with. She said it was a beautiful service. Turns out, she was an Episcopalian, and they have tried another church. Maybe her experience last evening will have her saying, I'll have me some of that at Good Shepherd. Our evening prayer service on that hilltop served her. Of course, a huge question is, what do we learn when we cease asking what Jesus can do for us and start asking how we can serve others? To return to Raising Cain's A.J. Kumaran, it's obviously unprecedented times. There's no playbook on how to get through it. And it is all hands on deck. That is an apt description of where we are at Good Shepherd, where we find ourselves. We hope we're coming out of unprecedented times that another COVID variant won't force us back into quarantine. And we need all hands on deck as we move into God's future for us. There is no doubt a challenge ahead for all of us, but there is also opportunity again for all of us. I have no doubt that our future is full of amazement, delight, and service. And what we learn from those we serve can only help us become better servants. It is an upward spiral. On this Commitment Sunday, do we commit to serve? with our time, talent, and treasure in order to build relationships with Christ, church, and community. In the midst of and coming out of the suffering that has been the exile of COVID land, to what is our high priest calling us? Amen.